Hello, and welcome to Novel Conversations, a podcast about the world's greatest stories. I'm your host, Frank Lavallo, and for each episode of Novel Conversations, I talk to two readers about one book, and together, we summarize the story for you. We introduce you to the characters, we tell you what happens to them, and we read from the book along the way. So if you love hearing a good story, you're in the right place. This episode's conversation is about the novel Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. And I'm joined by our Novel Conversations readers, Elizabeth Flood and Katie Smith. Elizabeth, Katie, welcome. Hi, Frank. Thank you. Glad to be here, Frank. Glad to have you both here to have this conversation with me. Uh, But before we get started, I want to give a quick introduction to today's novel. Written by French author Jules Verne, it was published serially in 1872 and in book form in 1873. Around the World in 80 Days tells the story of the unflappable Phileas Fogg and his trip around the world, accompanied by his emotional valet, Passepartout, to win a bet. This work was the most popular of Verne's extraordinary voyage novels or travel adventure novels, which of course include Journey to the Center of the Earth and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. So Elizabeth, we're quickly introduced to Phileas Fogg, one of our main characters. What do we know about him? Phileas Fogg is a London gentleman of meticulous and unchanging habits. He's the quintessential English gentleman and a member of the Reform Club. Katie, the Reform Club? Yes, the English Gentleman's Club. All leather and polished wood. He ate his meals there, played endless games of whist. They catered to his every whim. Katie, whist? Yes, whist. It's a classic English trick-taking card game like spades or hearts or bridge. It was widely played in the 18th and 19th centuries. But today, whist has become superseded by bridge. They do mention that they're gambling money on the whist, and Phileas Fogg always donates any money he wins to charity. Right. He appears to be independently wealthy, so he doesn't really need his gambling winnings. And he wins a lot. He does win a lot. Uh, Elizabeth, what else do we know about Phileas Fogg? He lives in a mansion on Seville Row. Very nice, but not sumptuous. He only had one manservant or valet. Well, he had one manservant. What do you mean by that? Well, he just fired his valet, James Forster. You would think serving a man who took all his meals and spent all his time at a club would be a pretty good gig. Phileas Fogg required him to be, quote, almost superhumanly prompt and regular. He's been fired because he brought Fogg his shaving water at 84 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And he's actually about to interview a new man. Well, Katie, before we introduce the other main character of our novel, tell us what we don't really know about Phileas Fogg. Is he rich? Has he traveled? Well, uh, that's just it. We don't really know. He's a very quiet and reserved man. And throughout the book, we are told that he's phlegmatic. He's very uh, impassive, I think is the word that they use. Nothing ruffles him. One of the club members mentions that they don't really know if he's ever been anywhere out of London, but he certainly seems to know a lot about other places. Right. It seems likely, they say. Seems likely. That he has traveled. That he has traveled. But there's no evidence for it. He doesn't have a family, no wife or children. So there are some unknowns about Phileas Fogg. Mm -hmm. That does play, of course, into the rest of our story. Well, if you're the silent type, you're probably mysterious as well. I wouldn't know. (laughs) <laughs> Elizabeth, do you want to introduce Passepartout? Jean Passepartout is a Frenchman who had a variety of jobs, including a circus performer in his younger days. But he now seeks a tranquil life. But Phileas does find one fault with Passepartout. Yes. His watch is four minutes slow. <laughs> and yet he is hired, and then Phileas is off to the club. And Passepartout has his program of the daily routine. When he finds himself alone in his room, he found a card tacked to the wall covering the daily program of the routine of the house. It was so precise, down to the very minute, from 8 in the morning, exactly at which fog rose, and all the details of service, the tea, the toast, 23 minutes later you have to do this. Tea at a certain temperature? Yes. Toast at a certain doneness? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's as... Everything was regulated and foreseen that was to be done from half past 11 a.m. till midnight, the hour at which the methodical gentleman retired. Well, I guess life with Phileas Fogg should be pretty tranquil for Paspa too, if not regimented. I'd never be able to do that job. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently ne- neither could James Forrester, right? Yeah. Well, I imagine even though regimented, the life with Phileas Fogg should be pretty tranquil. Until the bet. The bet? 
It happened right after Passepartout was hired. Well, the bet is the essential plot line of the entire novel. But before we talk about the bet and send Phileas Fogg around the world, let's take a break here. And when we come back, we'll start our countdown of 80 days. You're listening to Novel Conversations. We'll be right back. Mad Magazine. Advertising mascots. B-movie posters. And cartoons. Oh, yeah, can't forget cartoons. If you get the funky connection that ties these pop culture gems together, you'll dig two designers walk into a bar. See, we're a couple of creatively curious pals living between the bookends of grand museums and dive bars. Hey, you know the place, the sweet spot where highbrow and lowbrow become drinking buddies. So join our barroom chats as we talk influential work and uncover stories of how the familiar became iconic. Think behind the music for the stuff we love. Check out our website at two designers walk into a bar.com. And listen wherever you get your podcasts or visit evergreenpodcasts.com. Welcome back. Well, ladies, when we left, Phileas Fogg had hired a new valet, Paspa 2, and then left for his club, where he will make a bet that will drive the rest of our story. But Katie, before we can get to that bet, the Reform Club is all abuzz about something else. Yes, there's been a robbery. A robbery? Yeah, from the Bank of England. There have been 55,000 pounds stolen. Wow. Taken from the principal cashier's table. All right, but Katie, the bet. Yes. So after reading the Daily Telegraph that a new railroad in India had been made, it theoretically was possible to travel around the world in 80 days, as Fogg calculated. So Fogg bet his fellow members of the Reform Club that he could make the journey in 80 days or less. The wager is for the princely sum of 20,000 pounds, which is half of his fortune. His friends insist that although it might be theoretically possible, there's bound to be delays and unforeseen circumstances. There's no way that this could actually be done. But Phileas is convinced he can do it, and he can do it in 80 days. And as we've already said, he's willing to bet half of his fortune, 20,000 pounds, that he can do this. And he plans to leave that very night. Fogg and a shocked Passepartout board a train bound for Dover and Calais to begin their journey. And as readers, we soon learn about the first and potentially most problematic hurdle that Passepartout and Fogg will face. The first of many hurdles. Well, Elizabeth, tell me about this one. Based on a reported resemblance to the bank robber and Fogg's sudden exit... He left very quickly. Yes. Scotland Yard comes to believe that he was the bank robber. So, a detective, Mr. Fix, is sent to Suez in British-ruled Egypt to await the steamer Mongolia, on which Fogg and Passepartout are traveling. Once aboard the Mongolia, Fix befriends Passepartout. Eventually, later on, he will also become acquainted with Fogg. And after learning that they will take the steamer to Bombay, Fix buys a ticket and joins them. He's waiting for an arrest warrant to be sent from London, and he doesn't want to lose track of them. And part of the reason that Fix is so doggedly pursuing Mr. Fogg is that if he catches the bank robber and arrests him, he will get a 2,000-pound reward. That would be an incentive. That's heavy. But the Mongolia reaches Bombay before the arrival of the arrest warrant, and during the few hours before their planned departure for Calcutta on the Great India Peninsula Railway, Passepartout has the first of his many escapades. Passepartout visits a Hindu temple on Malabar Hill, unaware that not only are Christians forbidden to enter— but that shoes are not to be worn inside. I'm not sure what they would consider the greater sin. Well, he's beaten by enraged priests and barely makes it onto the train station on time. But they do get to the train, don't they? Yes. The train travels through India until stopping at the village of Colby, where Fogg learns that contrary to what was reported in the British press, the railroad is 50 miles short of completion. So the track isn't finished. No, and the passengers are required to find their own way to Allahabad to resume the train trip. I guess now would be a good time for us to mention that Fogg is traveling with a big bag of money. A lot of money. A fact that has already caught Fix's eye. Right, the detective. And so Fogg purchases an elephant and hires a Parsi man as elephant driver and guide. And so back on the journey. 
Not quite. While they're in the jungle, they encounter a group of people preparing for an act of sati, which is the immolation of a widow on her husband's funeral pyre. This was an old Indian custom that was not completely eradicated at that point. Fogg decides that they must rescue the young widow, but they can't come up with a plan. Right, the young widow's been drugged and she's guarded by priests and family. And so at the last minute, Passepartout disguises himself as the body of the late Raja, and as soon as the pyre is lit, he springs up and seizes the widow. And the party then flees before the ruse is discovered. They reach the railroad station in Allahabad and continue on their journey to Calcutta. But in Calcutta, Fogg and Passepartout are arrested and sentenced to prison. So London has finally caught up with them. Well, no. This is because of Passepartout's accidental intrusion into the Malabar Hill Temple in Bombay. But an unperturbed Fogg pays bail for them. And accompanied by the rescued widow, whose name is Aouda, they board a steamer bound for Hong Kong. And Fix, who had hoped the sentences would keep them in Calcutta long enough for the London warrant to arrive, joins them on the steamer headed to Hong Kong. And once in Hong Kong, Passepartout attempts to secure cabins on the boat to Yokohama and learns that its departure has been rescheduled for that evening. Fix is intent on keeping Phileas in Hong Kong because it's still English soil. If he gets out of Hong Kong, then the warrant will not be valid anymore. Right, it couldn't be served in a, in a different country. Yeah. Fix tells Passepartout why he is following Fogg and offers to pay him to help delay Fogg's departure. And when Passepartout refuses, Fix drugs him with opium, preventing him from returning to Fogg. And as a result, Fogg misses the steamer, not knowing that it was leaving early. However, he finds another ship that will take him to Shanghai, and he, Ayuda, and Fix all set sail. In the meantime, Passepartout manages to stagger onto the rightful ship to Yokohama. And the obstacles continue. Phileas Fogg does keep saying he prepared for delays and obstacles, and he refuses to worry about their schedule. But now he's on a hired ship with Aouda. And with Detective Fix, who told Phileas he also missed his ship to Yokohama. And Passepartout is on a different ship on a different schedule. Right. As a matter of fact, Passepartout ends up on a ship they had originally planned to get onto. It just had left a little earlier. Right. So he's ahead of schedule. And we don't know where Phileas is on his schedule. Well, he's taking a more direct route. So even though he's leaving a little late, he's saving time because he's not going in such a roundabout way. And it's on this leg of the journey that I guess we should mention Aouda starts to have some feelings for Phileas. Yes, it started as gratitude and respect, but it is becoming something more. All right, so before we find out if Paspa 2 ever catches up with Phileas Fogg and whether they can make their connections to Shanghai and San Francisco and whether Phileas makes a love connection, let's take a break and when we come back, we'll continue our journey around the world. We'll be right back. Hello everyone, my name is Tom Kearns and I host the Anglo-Saxon England podcast where I cover the history and culture of England from the departure of the Romans in the 5th century to the Norman Conquest in 1066. So far we've surveyed the collapse of Roman rule in Britain, the migration of the Anglo-Saxons and the history of Northumbria from its beginnings in the mists of legend to its destruction at the hands of Viking raiders in the 9th century. I hope you'll come and give it a go. Welcome back. You're listening to Novel Conversations. I'm Frank Lavallo, and today I'm having a conversation about the novel Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. And I'm joined by our Novel Conversations readers, Elizabeth Flood and Katie Smith. So before we took our break, Detective Fix, desperate to keep Fogg in Hong Kong until the arrest warrant arrives, told Paspatu why he's following Fogg and offers to pay him to help delay Fogg's departure. But when Paspatu refuses, Fix drugs him with opium, preventing him from returning to Fogg. And as a result, Fogg misses the steamer, but he finds another ship that will take him to Shanghai. And in the meantime, Paspatu managed to stagger on the ship for Yokohama. So, Elizabeth, let's catch up with Paspatu. Poor Paspatu arrives in Yokohama with no money for food or travel and no idea where Fogg is. In desperate need to earn some money, he joins a traveling circus. 
where, surprise, surprise, Fogg, having caught a Yokohama-bound steamer from Shanghai, encounters him just in time for them all, including Fix, to board the steamer that will take them to San Francisco. And since Britain has no jurisdiction in the United States, Fix is now as eager as the rest of them to get Fogg back to England quickly. The group boards a train bound for New York City. Finally, America. At least we know the trains run on time and the tracks are finished. <laughs> well, the train trip continues more or less uneventfully for now until it reaches Medicine Bow, Wyoming Territory, where a signal man tells them that the suspension bridge is too dilapidated to bear the weight of the train. Well, so much for strong tracks and kept schedules. Well, somebody suggests the idea of just going at top speed over the bridge and everybody else starts, you know, agreeing that this is a good idea except for Passepartout. And the engineer actually goes along with it. Oh, God. The plan works with the bridge collapsing as soon as the train reaches the other side. But in Nebraska, the train is attacked by a tribe of Sioux. Oh, of course they are. You can't have a European story about America without Indians. You can't. And the Sioux are on the point of winning the battle when Passepartout succeeds in uncoupling the train from the engine right outside Fort Kearney, and the soldiers garrisoned there frighten the Sioux into leaving. I, I hear a butt coming. Well, the Sioux capture Passepartout and two other passengers. Fogg rides to their rescue with a group of soldiers, but the recoupled train departs without them. More obstacles and more time lost. I think I remember at this point, Fogg reckons he's lost at least 20 plus hours from his schedule and with no prospect of getting to Nebraska for the train to Chicago. But Detective Fix to the rescue. Uh, you better explain that. Okay. So Fix has heard from someone, it's a little vague, about a sail-powered sledge. So using the sail-powered sledge, Fogg and the others are able to travel over all of the snow to Omaha, Nebraska, arriving just in time to board the train to Chicago. And from there, they catch a train to New York City, where they arrive 45 minutes after departure of the ship to England. Of course, they're late again. But Fogg finds an empty trading ship whose captain is somewhat willing to carry the group of four to Bordeaux, France. France? I thought they wanted to get to England. They do. So after bribing the crew and imprisoning the captain, <laughs> Fogg assumes control and sets course for Liverpool, England. And when a storm prevents the use of sails, the coal supply runs low. So Fogg buys the ship from the captain. There's that big bag of money. Yes. We perhaps have not made clear just how much bribing he does throughout <laughs> this whole book. And, and buying of conveyances. And, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Especially on this ship. So after he buys the ship, Fogg, Passepartout, and the crew begin burning the wooden parts of the ship. And then they get to Liverpool. But as soon as they arrive, Fix finally arrests Fogg. That scene happens very quickly uh, once they arrive in London. But then, just several hours later, quickly again, Fox learns that another man was responsible for the bank robbery. And so he releases Fogg. After all of this journey from Detective Fix chasing Fogg around the world, they sort of ended that situation a little abruptly, uh, I felt anyway. I agree, yeah. And as soon as he's let out. Fogg punches Fix in the face. He does. <laughs> he does. Finally, his anger comes out. Yeah. But he's got to get to the reform club. So he quickly orders a special train to take him, Passaportu, and Auda to London. However, they arrive in London five minutes too late to win the wager. Five minutes that cost him 20,000 pounds. Passepartout is beside himself thinking it's his fault because he never told Fogg that Fix was a detective that was trying to arrest him. The following evening, Fogg apologizes to Aouda for being unable to provide for her comfort as a result of losing the bet. She, in turn, proposes marriage to him, and he joyfully agrees. And Passepartout is sent to engage the clergyman. That's when he learns that their journey through the time zones has gained them a day and that they are not too late after all. 
He rushes back to notify Fogg, who arrives at the Reform Club with only moments to spare. And so, after all this, he wins the bet. And 20,000 pounds. And he's marrying Aouda. And what about Paspa, too? Well, he gives Aouda away. He's almost like one of the family now. He really is. He is an extremely loyal servant to Phileas Fogg. Well, he feels indebted because Fogg gave up his whole bet in order to go back and get him from the Sioux. And from that moment, he is completely attached to Fogg. He was loyal to him before that, though, because Fix had tried to convince him that Phileas was a bank robber and Passepartout didn't believe him, but Really, even if he was a bank robber, he still would have been loyal to him, and he refused to take the bribe. And so, essentially, our novel ends with everyone lives happily ever after. And that's the story of Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. All right, Katie, Elizabeth, let's take our final break, and then we'll head into our last segment, where I'd like to ask the two of you to share a moment or a character or a quote that we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. You're listening to Novel Conversations. I'm Frank Lavallo. We'll be right back. My name's Adam Sokol, and I'm the host of the Passions and Prologues podcast. Every week, best-selling authors like Jenny Jackson, Rebecca Mackay, Lisa Scottolini, or Brad Meltzer come on to my show to talk about, yes, their new books, but more importantly, the things that they're crazy passionate about. We've talked about the Muppets, powerlifting, traveling, gardening, home improvement, and so much more. We dig into why these things are their passions, how they inspire their writing, and where they came to fall in love with these random assorted things. Be sure to subscribe to the Passions and Prologues podcast wherever you get your podcasts, and check out evergreenpodcast.com to learn more. Welcome back. You're listening to Novel Conversations. All right, Elizabeth, Katie, before our break, we ended our story, and now I'd like to ask the two of you to share a moment or a character or a quote that we didn't have a chance to talk about yet. Elizabeth, do you have something for us? Yes. So one thing we didn't mention is that despite winning the 20,000 pounds, Fogg had spent 19,000 pounds in all the bribes and fees and bail and all of the extra expenses that came up along the way. Tips and gifts, too. Yeah. So he only made 1,000 pounds, which he actually gave, I believe, half of that to Passepartout and the other half to Fix. But it says at the end, what did he gain? He didn't gain any money from this, but it says he gained happiness because he had found Aouda. They were so in love. The moment where she asks him to marry her is just so beautiful, and uh, it made me so happy. If you don't mind, I'll read a little bit from that as well. Before I say this, I want to say Fogg had been completely emotionless imperturbable the entire book. This is the first time he really shows his emotion. Well, as you said at the very beginning, he was the quintessential reserved English gentleman. Aouda says, I pity you then, Mr. Fogg, for solitude is a sad thing with no heart to which to confide your griefs. They say, though, that misery itself shared by two sympathetic souls may be borne with patience. They say so, madam. Mr. Fogg, said Aouda, rising and seizing his hand, Do you wish at once a kinswoman and friend? Will you have me for your wife? Mr. Fogg, at this, rose in his turn. There was an unwanted light in his eyes and a slight trembling of his lips. Odo looked into his face. The sincerity, rectitude, firmness, and sweetness of this soft glance of a noble woman, who could dare all to save him to whom she owed all, at first astonished, then penetrated him. He shut his eyes for an instant as if to avoid her look. When he opened them again, I love you, he said simply. Yes, by all that is holiest, I love you and I am entirely yours. And I guess we should say it again. Aouda proposes to Fogg when she thinks he has no money, when she thinks he's lost everything. Great lines, Elizabeth. Thanks. Katie, you have something? Well, to go on what you guys were just saying, when he gains the money, he turns to Aouda and says, do you still want to marry me? Now that I haven't lost. One part that I really enjoyed in this book was when you think he's lost the wager and he goes back to his home and he decides not to go to the club. He's totally downtrodden and just goes home and so does Passapartout and then they get engaged. 
Then the next chapter begins from the perspective of his friends at the club, and it goes through their day of how they're counting the minutes and waiting for him and who thinks he'll be there and who knows he won't be there. And, and I think they're still making side bets on they that, are, aren't they? And they are, and they're watching the second hand on the clock, 40 seconds left, 15 seconds left, and he walks in right at the last moment that he possibly could. And as the reader, I thought, wait a second, is this choose your own adventure? Did he do something different? Is this what would have happened had he made the last train or whatever? But I thought that it was presented so well because at first I was disappointed that it was such a quick loss. And then um, it was really fun to see it from the outside and see how he actually got to win. So I just thought it was brilliant writing. I I wanted to talk about the Reform Club members and their uh, penchant for gambling. They gamble on whist. They gamble on whether uh, Phileas Fogg can go around the world. Uh, here's a, a couple of lines from Jules Verne. Everybody knows that England is a world of betting men who are of a higher class than mere gamblers. To bet is in the English temperament. Not only the members of the reform, but the general public made heavy wagers for and against Phileas Fogg, which were set down in the betting books as if he was a racehorse. Bonds were issued and made their appearance on the exchange. Phileas Fogg bonds were offered at par or at a premium, and the great business was done in them. But five days after the article in the Bulletin of the Geographic Society appeared, demand began to subside. Phileas Fogg bonds declined. They were offered by packages, at first of five, then of ten, until at last nobody would take less than twenty, fifty, a hundred. Even the English public got involved in whether Phileas Fogg could complete this journey in 80 days, and everyone was wagering pennies, pounds, whatever they could get their hands on. I wonder how many pounds were exchanged in total from that one bet. I'm sure some made money and some lost money. You know, on the market, they always say that bears can make money and bulls can make money, but pigs get slaughtered. Elizabeth, do you have another moment for us? Sure. I did think Jules Verne's characterization of Americans was pretty funny. And stereotypical for that time. Yeah. You know, Phileas Fogg at one point meets someone named Colonel Stamp Proctor, which (laughs) just seems like a ridiculous American name. And they are foes. They're going to have a duel in the train car because they didn't have time to have a, like, with with revolvers. They didn't have time to get off the train, so they agree to have this duel in the train car. And the train conductor is so apologetic. Oh, I'm so sorry that we don't have time for you to get out and have this duel. Like, I'm so sorry. It's just the circumstances. We're running late. So they give them this train car for them to shoot at each other in. Thankfully, they don't end up coming to that point. Yeah, because the Sioux come in. Right. Well, it is the Wild West. (laughs) Just the ridiculousness of it all is so funny to me. Mm -hmm. Katie, got another one? Yes, I do. So the reason that Phileas Fogg thinks he loses, but he has actually gotten there in time, is because he didn't take into account the time zones. So since he was traveling constantly eastward, he gained a day. So reading from the book, in journeying eastward, he had gone towards the sun, and the days therefore diminished from him as many times four minutes as he crossed degrees in this direction. There are 360 degrees on the circumference of the Earth, and these 360 degrees multiplied by four minutes gives precisely 24 hours. And in the beginning, the thing that was wrong with Passaportu is that his watch was four minutes slow. That was the one fault that Phileas found when he interviewed uh, Passepartout. Mm -hmm. That's right. I just thought that was a great uh, full circle back to the beginning. Back to the four minutes. The one thing that I want to mention, we didn't really mention, uh, but because Phileas and and Paspatou left in such a hurry, Paspatou forgot to turn off the gas lamp in his room. And even at that time, Phileas said, well, whenever we get back, that's what you're going to, you're going to owe me the money for that gas. And sure enough, Elizabeth, I think it was you that mentioned once Phileas wins his bet, he gives some of his winnings to Paspatou, but he does in fact charge Paspatou for the use of all that gas for the 80 days while they were away. So Paspatou too has to pay his bill, even though he had just received some money, uh, some winnings from Phileas. I thought that was just a great statement about Phileas Fogg. He may be in love and he may be getting married, but he's still Phileas Fogg. I also wanted to mention before we end that if you get the illustrated edition with Jules Verne's own etchings, they're absolutely gorgeous. Did you notice that Passaportu has the long nose mask hanging on his wall? Oh, I did not notice that. 
Because remember, right, when he escapes from the circus, he escapes with the nose and the wings, right? All right, Katie, Elizabeth, with that said, I think we'll end our conversation today about the novel Around the World in 80 Days. I want to thank both of you for coming in and having this conversation with me. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Of course. What fun. Thanks, Frank. Thanks so much. I'm Frank Lavallo, and you've been listening to Novel Conversations. Thanks for listening to Novel Conversations. If you're enjoying the show, please give us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find us on Instagram at Novel Conversations. Follow us to stay up to date on upcoming episodes and in anything else we've got in the works. I want to give special thanks to our readers today, Elizabeth Flood and Katie Portile. Our sound designer and producer is Noah Fouts, and Grace Sienna Longfellow is our audio engineer. Our executive producers are Bridget Coyne and Joan Andrews. I'm Frank Lavallo. Thank you for listening. I hope you soon find yourself in a novel conversation all your own. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Kearns, and I host the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, where I cover the history and culture of England from the departure of the Romans in the 5th century to the Norman Conquest in 1066. So far, we've surveyed the collapse of Roman rule in Britain, the migration of the Anglo-Saxons, and the history of Northumbria from its beginnings in the mists of legend to its destruction at the hands of Viking raiders in the 9th century. I hope you'll come and give it a go. This podcast was produced with the support of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit and in partnership with the Ohio Development Services Agency.